Good day, everybody. It's Greg Schnell, and I am here with the market review for the week of August 17th. Um, called it clues from afar. I still think there's more downside to go. That's what we're going to roll through. To find my blog, stockcharts.com, articles tab, drop down menu on the right, and you can find the Canadian technician. Don't ignore this chart and chart watchers. Um, if those interest you on a regular basis, please hit subscribe at the bottom. Contact information, you can always find me at gregs at stockcharts.com and I'm on Twitter at Schnell Investor. And our agenda today, we want to get uh, cover off the markets moved lower today, not meaningfully lower, about a half percent on the NASDAQ, that kind of thing, so nothing um, too wild. Shanghai actually moved up this week, which was odd. Um, US dollar, new two-year closing high, so on a weekly basis. This was the highest close we've had for two years, so that's pretty important. Um, commodities, we had a hammer candle last week, and I just want to talk about, you know, we're just seeing so much weakness in the industrial metals. The energy stocks are getting absolutely crushed. There are energy stocks that fell 20 and 30% this week on top of being in huge major downslides. So, um, dipping your toe in the energy sector right now is really, really difficult. Uh, REITs and utilities continue to lead the way on both sides of the border. Um, industrial commodities, as I mentioned, are down, uh, so that's a problem. And the big picture, I think, continues to deteriorate. All my um, uh, scans that I do behind the scenes uh, are all, all deteriorated meaningfully with REITs and utilities kind of uh, outperforming. So let's get into the charts. Lots to cover off here. Uh, so I want to start with the advanced decline line lately. I've been doing that a lot because it's been kind of the clue that's helped us get in and out of these markets. Um, we're still, uh, this made a lower low this week, and uh, albeit that's not that helpful. You can see on this low here on June 1st, it made a lower low and then bounced back up. Um, I just didn't see any real price action that was great. Um, the one thing that's continuing to surprise, I guess, is the semiconductors continue to hold up. They were okay on the week. Um, NASDAQ high low, uh, we're below zero, so that's just a hard place to make any money from. Uh, looking at the New York advanced decline line, held up better, and it's trying to hold this higher trend line. Now, we broke meaningfully with the August trend line, and that's when the the New York Composite actually broke down. We made lower lows here, uh, but we're trying to hold this this upsloping trend line. And again, the one difference between the New York Composite and the NASDAQ Composite is the NASDAQ's been making lower highs since last September, the New York Composite making higher highs. So um, the bottom line is it wasn't that great, but uh, we're up to about 100 net advancers over decliners um, on the NASDAQ, or on the New York if we want to look at the advanced decline uh, for the top 1,500 stocks, uh, getting back to zero here, which is nothing to sneeze at. That's good news. Um, I think the real uh, difficult part of the market here is normally, um, or over the last five years, we've seen a rally in the last two weeks of the year, uh, sorry, of the summer, from mid-August or options expiration into uh, September 1. So we'll continue to watch that, but it does feel like an oversold bounce is due, and I've got some charts to talk to that. Um, namely, the put-call ratio was kind of overextended. Looking at the advanced decline line, what we see for Toronto is this continues to go down. Uh, the Toronto market is desperately trying to hold this 16,000 level and although we haven't done anything between it for four months here, it's been, um, I'll call it wobbly. Uh, we st still don't see any real um, huge breakdown here. We haven't made a lower low on the advanced decline line. Um, so I'm continuing to watch it, but again, my data is pretty weak. But you can see back in October, September, October, November, this was the kind of downside we had Um you know, we've had relatively light down pressure so far in Canada. Um, so with that, uh, I'll just call it mixed. Now, the, the Canadian high-low data never did get bullish. Um, it stayed in that kind of trading range area, but we're below zero still. So nothing too optimistic, even on Friday's bounce. Uh, the high-low data, um, if you average the last five, we're still in red territory, and that's not that, that bullish. 
Let's go into the McClellan oscillator and one of the things I like to watch on the oscillator is moves below 400 and you can see in May it took a while to get below 400. We just got below 400 here at the beginning of the week and so it's the 400 up here is what we're watching. Obviously we're we're hovering below zero because the market's declining so so we have uh a low McClellan oscillator, a low summation index, and just historically, looking back over in here, oh, since 2018, you can see that we didn't get much more bearish than that, uh, than the current levels, um, with the exception of uh, the big pullback in the fall, um, October through November, December. So what we want to watch for now is how weak is the market? Is it really going to break down that hard? And I just think the global picture is so messy that um, it will pull down the bigger stocks eventually here. So the summation index um, for the New York Composite, this just goes back uh, to 2005. And again, moves below 400 typically um, create market pullbacks. Here's the New York Composite down here. Still have a little bit of room, let's call it 12,000 would be where that trend line kind of intersects. And what we want to watch for is how much weakness do we have. Now you can see even back here coming off the big lows in 2009, we rallied up, pulled back. And just when you start to get bearish, all of a sudden it took off to the upside and it stayed up at that high level. We're slightly below that, we're down around the 200 level. But as you can see, um, you know, we got down to to the 200 level bounced out of there that was a pretty good bounce ran up and then pulled back hard in 2010 and it was that big drop in there that uh, again keeps knocking the confidence out of investors i think more importantly for us um you know the data is mixed right here but i just see everything being weak um over and over so if we just go through you know some of the the sectors retail got hammered energy uh, just keeps getting uh, thrown out here financials down hard uh, discretionary is down two percent on the week semiconductors with marginal improvement uh, you know up 0.67 on the week but if we look across the commodity sector you know these were horrific the marijuana names just got crushed on the back of some bad earnings there but look at these rare earth metals remember we were all bullish on electric cars and lithium i mean these things are in two-year declines and they just keep working their way lower another five percent this week look at steel here and silver miners even though silver was up uh the silver miners uh down by four percent on the week gold miners down by three percent so that trade seems to have run its course Gold and the bond tend to trend together, so we might see some softness in the bonds just for a couple of weeks here. Once it kind of gets mainstream media, that's usually enough to at least give it a pause in its trend. Copper, I wouldn't call it up this week. It was up one cent. Let's just say flat. And then West Texas was up a half a penny or point, uh, not half a penny, um, 30 cents on the dollar. Uh, so 54.80. But looking across here, there was nothing really exciting. Lumber was kind of an interesting one um, and natural gas. And lumber was probably more interesting because uh, Jimmy Pattison, a big uh, entrepreneur in Canada, um, decided to take Canfor Forest Products private. Um, he's owned a huge chunk of Canfor before and I think he's taken it private before and then rolled it back to public and now he's taken it back private a lot like the rich kinder model so um, anyway he obviously thinks we're near the bottom because he's uh, decided to start buying that anyway with all of that going on I would just say that the picture for um, you know commodities didn't look very good globally and if we went to um, if we went to the global markets you know there there wasn't a whole bunch of celebration going on and the commodities continued to to really get hard hit hard and they stayed up longer than everything else normally what we would see normally who knows what normal is anymore normally what we would see is that the energy and materials are kind of the last thing to roll over well uh, oils actually held up okay uh, the material sector clearly getting smoked here 
But we're now starting to see the commodity countries like Australia, Russia, and Brazil uh, roll over quite hard. And we saw Argentina, you know, drop 50% or something on the week. It was a horrific week for them. And then looking down, uh, you know, Canada and the U.S., we were just kind of middling in the middle here, down 1%. S&P was down 1%. So no real big downside pressure there. I would say we put in that Dow down 800 day on Wednesday and rallied off the lows. But I think my my concern is I haven't seen anything turn yet to say we're turning. So I still have to stay with the direction we've been going and that appears to be down. Uh, the NASDAQ uh, summation index at minus 400 here, this is pretty bearish. Normally, minus 200 starts to break down, and you can see that was kind of one of the big differentiators here um, at the end of uh, September, October. And so we're, we're doing that again here. So that's one of the other things that makes me think we're probably going to break lower. Bullish percent indexes were still well below 50%, down to 40% on the NASDAQ for the percentage of stocks above the 200-day moving average. The May low was just slightly lower than this for the weekly close, and then we rallied out of the hole there. But, you know, normally we don't get this week without making a big decline. So this is, a, I'll call it a trickier, -er, if that's a word, in here. Um because of the the sideways rally we've got going on, we just kind of keep jogging around this level, haven't made any real progress to the upside. But again, 40% on a buy signal, 40% above their 200-day moving average, that's hard to make a bull market. NASDAQ 100, only 40% are on a buy signal, but 60% are still above their 200-day moving average. Looking in on the New York Composite, this one's got 41% on a buy signal and uh, just 50% on are above their 200-day moving average. So with that pretty weak backdrop, and again, just looking at the green line, you can see when it gets this week, um, we're on the last edge of success here. If this is going to rally, it should probably do it right away. On the S&P 500, what we see here is a 45%. 46% level and 55% above the 200 day. But I've got these little red arrows in here. I don't move them every week. But in general, once you start dropping past this point, um, usually we see a bigger downslide. So that's a, uh, I would just say we're there again. And, you know, unless some rabbit comes out of the hat this week, I would expect, you know, maybe migrate sideways to up uh, just because of the selling pressure we've had and then roll back over. But, um, again, just doesn't look strong enough to me and it doesn't look like we've had a big enough, uh, crush to, to make a final market low, in my opinion. To, uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange, 58% of the stocks are still on a buy signal. I think that has to do more with the gold sector has been pretty strong, but we even started to see the silver and gold sectors, um, the actual stocks in their breakdown this week. I don't know if that's because of the U.S. dollar breaking to the upside, but I would suggest that that's one of the things that I'm more concerned about uh, is all of a sudden that seems to be changing. And if we look at the um, percentage of stocks above the 200-day moving average, we're at 60%. And, you know, all the energy sectors are obviously below, so everything else is kind of holding there. This is the energy kind of smorgasbord or the energy dashboard. And what we see up in the top is West Texas crude just hovering around its 50-day moving average. Bullish percent index way down at 20%, but it can go a lot lower like it did in November, December. Looking at the XLE, we're drilling down near those December lows already. And XOP is well below the December lows and, and the oil service uh, business is down here. So what is it in XLE that's holding it up? It's things like um, uh, renewable energy, uh, utilities, that type, type of stuff that is supporting that chart. I will say on this bullish percent index, um, for energy, I track the XOP here. In this case, I've got the OIH, but we're breaking down hard. The one thing, you know, just looking at this, this is the OIH going back to 2000. 
and that's the oil services business. And we're down near the 2000, 2002 lows. Like these companies have just been taken out to the woodshed, the charts. You know, there's there's companies dropping 50% this week. Um, just horrific slides after falling a long way already. They're just getting sold and sold and sold. We're, we're below zero now on this indicator. And this indicator is the momentum of the bullish percent index. We're in negative territory. Now we could start looking for a turn up, but it doesn't seem like we're there yet. I, the charts just look so weak, and when we get to the dollar, I think you'll understand. Uh, so here's gold, and what we see down at the bottom is uh, the gold miners are starting to underperform um, this uptrend that we had going here. They're starting to underperform gold, so that suggests caution. Um, the gold miners... ETF, if I just draw a line under here, I would say we're on the last leg of this journey uh, for now. And then we're up around 90% uh, of the stocks are on a buy signal. So that's kind of as high as it's going to get. And then we have GLD still drilling up in the right hand corner. So that's a little bit better. S&P 500, so now that we're on options expiration day, do we get a reversal here? And a lot of times we do. So, um, you know, I think it's important to keep watching. We're right at this, look at how often we hit this level here. I've had this on the chart and, um, you know, it's very close to options expiration in some cases, but we continue to just work around this 2800 level. And I think once um, this market finally decides if it wants to break down, when it goes through that 2800, that will probably be a meaningful um, inflection point. Uh, this is the put call ratio that I mentioned, and it was soaring up near 1%. And that, that was pretty high. You know, we had the December low was on that sort of a ticker. Now, the rate of change that we've seen in the bond market recently, and we'll get to the bond market charts, the rate of change that we have seen on those charts, uh, they have moved so far that uh, there was a really interesting quote put out by Bloomberg, and I think Linda Rashke retweeted it. Uh, and it was basically when we saw the last seven moves of the bond market moving this aggressively, it was in uh, major stress time for the market. So this is not just a, a regular routine pullback here. I think this trend line right here will be in, in watch mode uh, for the next few days, uh, trying to get through. This is the S&P 500 over a one-month period. And can we start to push back up? But um, again, there's, there's not a lot of economic data coming out, uh, not a lot of earnings data coming out to start pushing that chart around. And this uh, blue line level on the market obviously goes all the way back into 2018. And when we see that change, um, the you know we just keep hovering around that, trying to hold those prior highs, and uh, you know becoming more and more of an important support and resistance line. And I think if the market uh, gives it up here, that's probably a pretty significant reversal. And again, we'd have some sort of an uptrend line here that is broken trying to test and hold and, and break back out. And I think if that doesn't work, then that'll be more meaningful. Now, we also noticed that this slope was in place here heading into October. If we take this line and move it over here, it's this is a flatter slope. But again, if this starts to go, um, so that would be off the January, May, um, August lows. If we start to lose that that sort of a trend line there, I think what we'll find is that's when the market really does break down hard. So we're we're uh, up against that right now and trying to use that for support. For the S and P five hundred big picture, we had the failed breakout from June. We're sitting here in August and just kind of grinding sideways. Haven't broken below this flat two hundred um, or forty week moving average something to keep watch on. Same thing for the NASDAQ. We had a false breakout where we broke out, couldn't hold it. And now we're just hovering underneath it. And on the Russell, we're back testing support and trying to hold there. All of these uh, charts, you can just see, um, you know, if they started to break down meaningfully, that would kick in a lot more sell um, algorithms. If they can hold here, um, 
that's a, a very important distinction for the charts. I just think the global pressure um, is, is too difficult uh, for these markets to move meaningfully higher. And I don't think a rising US dollar is going to help them a whole bunch. Here's the NASDAQ 100 and we can see it broke the uptrend line here on relative strength. Hasn't started to refire back to the upside and I think that's what we'd need to see for this to start to change. Um, on the big picture, the NASDAQ weekly, we've been in a four-year uptrend. That still holds. You can see our momentum has given us a sell signal and push down now we had one briefly in may june well it was actually in may and then we rolled up in june the problem we have right here is you know it's kind of like okay we try to rally we pull back we try to rally again and we fail and it's that second failure that makes things a little more dicey so that's what i continue to watch for big picture new york composite we're going back to 2009 here not using the 2009 low we broke that line quite a while ago but running a line up underneath the 10, 11, 15, 16, 2018 lows, we're trying to hold that. We've got a flat 10-month uh, moving average on the New York Composite, and we're sitting pretty much right at that level. We're at 12,580. That level's at 12,550. Again, we just want to keep watching to see how the market's going to handle this sort of topping structure, and I think... Um, you know, the next two weeks, this is a monthly chart. Can't use the endpoint for anything other than just, you know, how's it looking? And so far this month, we're down, right? So um, just trying to keep, keep a broad mind as to what might be going on on the big picture. If anything tells you, you know, look at the chop between 12,250 and 13,250. It's just been uh, a big sideways mess for a while here. The Russell came down and tested the support level. One of the reasons I think we tried to bounce. We're back below zero on the momentum and continuing to accelerate lower. I Obviously, we've heard enough about that, but I don't like that. That's a big sell signal for me. And until that starts to improve, I uh, still want to be very, very careful here. Anyway, uh, whether it's a line chart, a candlestick chart, bar chart, whatever, uh, we're, we're definitely trying to test this horizontal support level. Let me just see if there's, yeah, here's the Toronto Stock Exchange. So we're back below the 50-day the moving average, still holding above the 200 and trying to hold on to the late May low. Uh, if that can, you know, put in a double bottom here, maybe that gives them us some kiln to the upside but i think even if we get a rally we'll probably stall at the 50 day uh, looking at the big picture so weekly here you can just see this 20 week moving average that would be the center of the bollinger bands if you look on the chart when we kind of go below that that guided us for almost four months went below here guided us for three months went below here guided us for three or four months and now we've gone below and spent two weeks down here so um three weeks below it so it's starting to look to me like the move is to the downside and um, most of the people following my work wouldn't be surprised by that okay so uh here we are the this is the each stock has the same weight, so not market cap weighted. So a small company is as important in this calculation as uh, Microsoft at a trillion dollar company. By taking away the bias of market cap, we can just see what the broad economic picture is doing. And again, when we have this down sloping 40 week moving average, that's kind of an important area to watch. And, you know, back in the 2000s, this was very choppy and wasn't giving it up easily. I feel like that's kind of how it is right now. But we do have momentum below zero. And that's the kind of, um, you know, signal that we get to just say, be very, very cautious. Shanghai closed up on the week, had an inside bar, higher low, lower high, still below the 40-week moving average and the 10-week moving average. The PPO momentum is right at zero. And what I wonder here is can we finally get some sort of optimism in China and America towards the trade deal? And I know they're going to get together in a couple of weeks in um, I think it was by phone. I don't think they planned on a visit. Um, but the 
the main point that we want to talk about here is if there's starting to be some optimism, we should start to see this chart show up right about here. And this would be a good place to get on board. When we got those signals back in early 2018, um, you know, a, a big drop down talking about tariffs and that's, that um, moved the market pretty hard. You can see the Shanghai underperformed for a long time. And then uh, had a brief rally in early 2019 with the rest of the world. We've been pulling back in momentum and now we're right at zero. And the real question is, do we find any new momentum here or does this just keep making another wave lower? So we're kind of at the decision point for that. The Nikkei chopped around on the low end of the range all week here. I, I'm not happy with the price action in the Nikkei, um, never am it seems like, but um, you know we made the high back in October of last year, 24.4, so 24,400 or 24,500, and now we're at 20,000, and we're just trying to hold this level, and we've broken through this 21,000 level, that's been a better level of support, and we seem to be drizzling lower here, so we had a low last week, that low has held so far, um, but again, the, these charts don't have a lot of upside uh, look to them at this point. This is the US dollar chart. And on this chart, um, it's a bar chart. So it doesn't show that this is sitting in an all-time high, but it's an all-time closing high. And the way we can do that is just by changing it to a solid line. And then what we'll see is that, um, you know, this is kind of the highest close um, all the way through here. And this 97.5 has been important. I want to keep watching my PPO here. If this is going to start to come down to zero and bounce and take off to the upside, that's huge. Now, we still have this downtrend line to worry about. My big point is look at the sudden acceleration this week. And again, it's using close only data. But if this is going to start to pop to the upside, I think that would be one of the big things that kind of extends this market to the downside. Um, and and once, you know, kind of the coast clears and the dollar starts to give it up and people invest in the rest of the world again, that might be our better clue as to when a real hard bottom is starting to be put in. So while I say that like it's not here tomorrow, um, the one thing that, you know, this US dollar has continued to just literally make slightly higher highs and then roll right back over. So um, hardly can I be prophetic in, in where uh, the US dollar is going because it, you know, last week I wrote it was frustrating. This week it's breaking out to a new high. Um, so it just keeps working us. This is a daily chart. So again, Friday's close wasn't the highest daily close, but it was the highest weekly close. And, uh, you know, we're still trending up here coming off the uh, June lows in the dollar. And as we break out to this higher high here, again, one of the things to just keep watching for, if all of a sudden the dollar starts to ramp up, I think that's where we start to see the pressure in the rest of the world. And that'll probably royal the um, equity markets even more. At the EU level here, we, we continue to press down in this bottom corner. And, you know, there's many Forex people who expect this to drop lower. You can see our PPO is starting to accelerate to the downside after it got up to this trend line. Meaningful place to look for change. If this was going to start to rotate up here, that would be very helpful. We're not seeing that so far. Again, we just got our sell signal here a couple weeks ago, and now it's continuing to accelerate lower. Lower euro, higher US dollar just says to me, um, and again, this is the last three weeks. And what have we seen in the stock market as the euro went lower and the dollar went higher? We've had um, lower, lower levels on the stock market. So if the dollar is about to start running, I think that might show up on these current, uh, on the equity charts. Okay, um, I'm not going to go through each one of these currencies because I didn't really see anything. I will say the Swedish krona didn't give me any clues other than it's not bouncing at all. It's glued to the bottom. So it does make me think that the euro wants to go lower. British pound finally had an inside week after dropping for three weeks here. So um, took out the 2015-16 lows. It's at new 20-year lows. And now that it's made those lows, it's just trying to bounce there and see if there's any support for a buyer.
let's go to the Japanese yen and the yen has broken this big downtrend line and has been working its way higher it pushed up big last week and then pulled down this week still doesn't give it a sell signal the momentum curve um, still higher on the weekly and again it's broken this downtrend line much like the euro uh, you know we're just starting to see different behavior from from these currencies they're breaking big major trend lines and when that starts to happen usually there's something going on in equities um, looking at uh, and the other thing was the japanese yen just kind of going sideways here at 95 it seems like it's rolled over the last few days to pause but gold is starting to do the same so they're closely correlated and the and tlt and and gld have been correlated quite tightly recently so if we start to see bonds just ease off the gas pedal a little bit here for a while wouldn't be a surprise that gold did the same so here's the canadian dollar and we're back around 75 and a half uh, not doing much to keep us um, give us any new information there Okay, Aussie dollar, clearly 10-year lows here. Uh, what we're watching for is just to see if it can start to get a bounce. Haven't seen anything that told me that. Um, their stock market down in Australia broke out above this big trend line for 10 years or whatever, fell back down, and it also had just broken above the 2007 high and fell back down. So um, with all of that correlation and it's given it up quick quickly now we want to watch and see if it can hold about 6400 here the prior highs and looking at the uh, australia dollar what we see again um, just this big general downtrend and some sort of a rally in the bottom corner who'd be surprised but it doesn't seem to me like it's ready to go yet i will say this PPO that actually pushed to a new lower low might just tell us there's a bit of exhaustion here, but um, too early to call that. The the global currencies for emerging markets uh, trying to stay above the 65 week moving average. You can see a brief surge up and now pulled back for three weeks, broken the upsloping trend line. You know that was a pretty good clue when this broke. That emerging markets were going to keep breaking down we just had that trend line break this week doesn't feel that um, weak here but we've also seen the emerging markets break down so if emerging markets are going to break lower and uh, the emerging market currencies are breaking lower that might be one of the other stories about why the yen or why the u.s dollar starts to accelerate not that it's a big part of the picture the emerging market currencies but still it's giving us a clue that the dollar is going to get this strength. As we get into the commodities, we'll see why that might be a fit. Okay, briefly, we're going to go through the bonds. I covered the bonds off on the Wednesday market buzz show when we when the TLT inverted in the morning or the 10-year, 2-year inverted. So if you'd like to go catch the market buzz um, for that day, so that would be the 14th. Uh, hopefully you'll find some information about that there so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it but here it's a continuation of the trend LIBOR closed in the bottom right hand corner doesn't seem like even a bounce coming into play yet HYG continues to let go that's energy dominated we're below the 10 week line we're back below this horizontal support and resistance all our momentum's rolled over so it's a little hard to call um, that this isn't ready to go lower but Everything just feels like it's hanging on an edge, and if we get some sort of a bounce here, it'll relieve a little bit of pressure. If we don't get the bounce, I think things could really accelerate quickly uh, just because of the location and timing on the charts. Here is the IEF weekly, and it, it ended up, during the week, it was actually above this 113.80, but it ended up closing below, so we're sitting here just watching but we're definitely testing the prior highs this is the seven to ten year treasury bond um, unadjusted so the yield is backed out just continuing to watch that to see if there's any clues there we're starting to have this big decline here where the um, hyg the high yield bonds are underperforming the seven to ten year bonds and you can see that we had that in 2014-15 um, stalled at the 
at the 40 week moving average stalled at the 40 week moving average now we're starting to accelerate down we're making new three-year lows and that was kind of when the market topped out uh, in 2015 we accelerated pretty much all the way right down into the final lows LQD what we see here uh, we've broken out to new highs so this is the corporate bonds and again uh, Paul Tudor Jones was expecting this to be the next place for trouble to show up on these bonds um, at this point it's still a safety trade and everybody's moving into them so um, tips uh, government uh, inflation protected bonds this has been rising at pretty well in concert with the gold line here that's the price of gold you can see we got up to this level at the top in 2016 and that's when gold rolled over so we're at similar highs might be a place to just watch and and in terms of momentum it's kind of an extreme that we um, got to a few times before so it's probably worth um, monitoring very closely this is the kind of acceleration we've seen in TLT and with that acceleration and if we just um, talk about when when bond rates change so quickly or bond prices change so quickly as I mentioned earlier that's the kind of thing it's it's not the level it's the rate of change that's trying to tell us something is different this time so uh, lots of that in the bond market right now the uh, municipal bond market continues to push to higher highs I don't have any deviation yet or any uh, divergence so everything still looks like it wants to go higher so just while we think it's extended it doesn't mean it is the 10 year is now down um, at the levels it kind of made the lows at it 2012-2016 and so we're we're all watching remember when we broke below 2% we were wondering if it was going to hold well, we lost another 25% this week. So these interest rates are falling dramatically. And, and during that um, move, that's, that's the kind of thing that we need to be watching for. And obviously nobody expects the U.S. market to go to negative interest rates. But nobody expected the rest of the world to do that either. So we'll keep watching to see how this plays out. Um... The, the one chart, so here's the five year. And the only reason I want to show you this is it's, you know, this is a, a road straight out of town. These low levels on the PPO here, we got down here in 2016. It doesn't mean it's over. It just means it's definitely extreme. Um, the 30 year, uh, uh, this PPO chart is now becoming more important. And one of the reasons was I mentioned down here, um, that the MACD, if it was going to get above this 2 or 3% level, when it did that, that was pretty high. And, um, you know, we could be looking at a reversal in play here as we get here. And it started to roll over and then literally accelerated up. But because the MACD waves get bigger as price goes higher, um, that's a, it skews the data a little bit with this 3% level, whereas or this 3 level up here when we do the same thing in percentage you can see that we could get all the way up to four percent and we've hit that one two three four five times in the last 30 years and uh you know if we did that again we're only half done the move we're at two and a half percent uh just under two and a half percent and to get all the way to four would obviously be quite a quite a significant blow uh anyway my the point I want to make there is we have no negative divergence yet. So normally what would happen is on your final high, so like in here, price made a high and this made a high and then price made a higher high, but this made a lower high. And that was kind of the clue that something was changing on the bond market. And I think we called that pretty good, but we don't have any of that yet at all. So, um, you know, yeah, we'd run up, we'd pull back, and then we'd run up one more time to the extreme top. Okay, let's move off bonds because there's just uh, so much time in a day. Let's get down into the transports. 
they broke through the bottom of this support again and they're trying to rally out of here it is just one of those markets that keeps um you know testing 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 um levels and now we're coming back up to this ten thousand level again Looking at the transports weekly, that's the 10,000 level. Uh, PPO is below zero, so momentum is negative. And, and again, you're not trying to cheer it on. The only thing that would be nice is if we could, um, when we stay around this zero level, it's just so uncertain. But, you know, again, um, we, we got down here at the end of May and turned around. Now we got down here and we closed right on the 10,000 level or just under it. Uh, we'll see which way this one wants to go, but the, the big picture continues to say lower. Airlines, I don't know about you, but that's a mess. Nothing I want to own. And uh, here is the airlines chart going back for five years. Nothing I want to own there either. And looks like the momentum wave is rolling over here. Let's just turn on the zoom thumbnail and that'll make it easier to see. We'll just save that with it. But the point on this, by putting in the zoom thumbnail, we can see that we got a new sell signal on the PPO. Uh, the histogram went below zero, so the line went below its signal line. And now what we want to watch for is what's going to happen with the um, actual uh, PPO line when it goes negative that's an important place to watch and that's what we saw back in October November December time frame so uh, continuing to <laughs> to monitor that to see if there's any new information there but again this chart has worn out pretty much every investor railroads um, continued to have lower relative strength Friday gave a little bit of a kick back up but nothing um, meaningful you can see that we broke through support here i don't like when the railroads are weak um, when we look back in october this was kind of big push down um, january february this was a big push down so all of the kind of big moves in the railways um, are usually explained uh, with big moves in the market the other thing i don't like is the relative strength on the railways breaking this four-year uptrend that tells me bigger problems ahead and the other thing about that bigger problems ahead would mean industrial metals and commodities. Okay, trucking. Um, this has actually been okay. It's been, uh, the, the momentum down here in the bottom right hand corner has been pointed up higher. Um, we broke this subtle downtrend line and now look like we're rolling over again near zero, but we haven't rolled over. And unlike the overall transport, uh, group we're we're above this horizontal support and resistance line but we've been making you know lower highs for the last three or four weeks here so uh, haven't been able to push anything around autos just ugly nothing really to report there okay let's get in i just want to look at the the broker dealers here you can see they broke down but uh, put in a hammer candle this week maybe they're going to bounce up and look at where the momentum is right at zero and i can't tell you how many of these charts it's just hanging around this zero level trying to hold on utilities had a good week made a higher high looking at xli it continues to just uh, grind sideways in this range here so after making a lower low a lower high um, close slightly lower than last week but we're still grinding in the sideways range so pretty hard to call anything there but momentum unlike or like everything else has rolled over onto a sell signal for the time being on the weekly charts the semiconductors one of the things about the semiconductors is they're holding up in relative strength quite well so that's one of the reasons to kind of have some optimism here and uh, again, if China and the U.S. started to make a deal, we'd probably see this chart really take off. Um, at this point, you know, it's just been, uh, hasn't been falling, but it hasn't been rising. I'd just say it's consolidating for the last couple of weeks here. So we'll figure out if that's just a bear flag on its way down or if it's got more room to the upside. CRB. Again, we're down near the bottom of this range, and this month we made a lower low than the December low, so um, that's ugly. U.S. dollar going higher isn't going to help that, obviously, so um, the commodities are under pressure. The, the low was last week, much like the equities market low was last week. We had higher lows on the NASDAQ and on the S&P this week. If that continues to hold, 
and that marks a double bottom or a triple bottom or whatever in some of these perhaps this is where it all turns but with the US dollar starting to ramp up that's not what I think is going to happen and when I went through the oil stocks I could not believe the devastation um, and that just tells me nobody's stepping in to buy near these lows here so um, quite disturbing on that front and, and I want to talk specifically about that for a second. So there are um, some, some regular commentators on TV and it's like, I want to buy ExxonMobil for yield. Well, ExxonMobil has dropped 10% in the last three weeks. And the yield is, you know, 3 or 4%, 5%, whatever it is. But, you know, buying something for yield while the, while the price is dropping is very, very difficult. And so just... Um, temper the enthusiasm for the energy sector until we start to see some price stability there and we're not seeing these stocks stabilize yet. Uh, the commodities living down in the bottom right hand corner but they didn't bounce at all this week I don't think so that looks weaker to me. Let's look at oil. Oil's trying to hold this uptrend line it's ticked up a little bit here just below it. Um, I don't have an answer which way it's going to go. It's still in this kind of triangle off the top and rising lows and which, you know, this is broken. If it uh, quickly reversed to the upside, that'd be like a failed breakout or something or failed breakdown. More importantly, I think is, is that it's undecided. It just keeps oscillating back and forth above the 10 week line. Currently it's below it. Um, that bothers me. I like the natural gas setup much better. And the reason is this is such an, a historic low um, down in here. And if it could start to grind its way higher, that would be a nice place to get on board. Heating oil has broken the uptrend. Gasoline has really broken the uptrend with no kind of pause. So I think gasoline's telling us um, crude's coming lower still. And I know we've got uh, the Saudis trying to work against that. Corn plummeted this week. Uh, Soya beans fell down slightly wheat extended its downtrend from the beginning of June so um, nothing in the ag sector there gold and still silver still looking okay um, but I'll remind you the miners didn't they actually made lower highs this week or they made lower closes this week copper's trying to hold after breaking down this down or this big three-year trend line trying to hold here and and it did so. I think it was up one penny, so that's okay. Aluminum fell back a little bit. I, again, this big data spike down here doesn't really help us, but just in general, this trend was down to sideways. Now it's down again if we ignore that. Looking at the livestock index pretty much uh, tells the story. That is straight out of town. Sugar below its 10-week. Uh, coffee below its 10-week. Cocoa uh, broke the uptrend. Cotton continues to drift lower. This week was a little bit of a bounce. Uh, marijuana names broke this uh, two-year trend line. I'd use extreme caution if you want to trade there. I think I preached that lesson for a while. There was a couple of places in there. I thought we might get some turn. Even some of the stocks looked this week like they were going to try and make the turn, but um, they all broke down hard. Here's your coal ETF, uh, literally unloading, steel ETF doing the same thing. So nothing telling us to get back involved in the industrials yet. Lithium made new two-year lows here, same thing on rare earth metal. So when all of the commodities are actually down uh, below their 10-week, that's a good place to look for a reversal. So I keep thinking I'm too bearish and we might get something like that because everything's oversold. But it just doesn't seem to matter yet. Um, it seems to be a much bigger move. So here is the energy sector and it, we got somewhat of a bounce off Thursday's low. Um, that doesn't give me any real comfort just yet. So I'd need to see something more than one day up to call that. Here's Crack, the ETF for the refiners. It is clearly dropping below this big two-year trend line. Um, when the refiners, which are typically the larger oil companies as well, start to break down, this is a, a pretty meaningful problem. When we can see uh, downtrend and momentum rolling over below zero, none of that spells success. Frack, um, trying to bounce after breaking below the December lows, 
it could get all the way back up to the 50-day moving average and wouldn't be enough to kind of rotate the charts. So here's the weekly. You can see very difficult to want to own this here. Momentum still pushing down hard. We didn't even have a slowdown in momentum this week. So it's uh, if you're worried about missing the uptrend, I think we could wait until at least we get one week higher. Um, West Texas, again, that's the, the pennant that we had drawn and now broke through the downside and trying to hold it. Uh, looks a little cleaner on the weekly chart, but we're below zero rolling over on the PPO. We've talked about this, but that's just a bad place for, for the market to roll over and we could get the same sort of thing we had in mid-2017 where oil chopped sideways. Uh, big annual picture, nothing really there. XOP up in the top here. You can just see this downtrend and all of these stocks are getting sold. Um, when I went through the energy names, like... Uh, you know, big companies are are living either at the end of a two-year trend, a uh, sideways trend, and just barely breaking down or trying to hold that bottom edge, or they're like literally bombing out to new five-year lows, stuff like that. Uh, the, the moves are just so extraordinary. So here, as an example, one of the companies I actually thought would be doing pretty good Here's Apache. It is at five-year lows and just drilling down in the bottom right-hand corner. Then we go to companies like BP, and it's trying to hold this two-year low. Um, Chevron's one of the better ones. You know, these are uh, trying to hold up, but again, they're they're moving below their 10 and 40-week moving averages. Momentum is rolling over. This doesn't look like the place to get involved in the energy sector yet. Uh, lots to go. And a lot of the royalty distribution companies are just breaking down really, really hard. So um, all that to say it looks rough out there, and I don't think it's time to step in front of the in front of the boat that's about to drive over. So uh, let's just wait and just see if we get better opportunities there. Um, gasoline, or sorry, natural gas, it's all about um, the, the size of this low base. And if we just open this chart up, what we want to see here is you can see the 2012 held around the $2 level. We're down here at 203, bounced up to 230 this week or 220 this week. So with everything trying to um, uh, rally uh, off of this low, this might be one of the charts that I like the most. And it's, it's really due to its historic levels of low rather than anything I see on the chart yet. We're not above the 10 week, we're not above anything. Um, even on this up week, we still had lower volume, like there was hardly anything to cheer for there. Okay, um, natural gas, just, you know, here's an example, cabot oil and gas. This chart's just destroyed and it's sitting way at the bottom of its range. Uh, if I go put that up, you know, it looks like the Apache chart where it's just busting lower. And again, this was a $24 stock mid-July. It's a $16 stock now. So 33%. The momentum, you know, trend broke kind of slow at first and then really started to break down as it went below these uh, new 52-week lows. That's what I'm worried about is the whole thing looks like a uh, uh, it, it could literally explode lower rather than higher. Um, and maybe when I get that bearish, we should probably look to the upside, but it just seems so uh, rough right now. Nuclear energy utility companies, even those charts are down in the bottom right-hand corner, so that must say something about power demand. Um, here's uranium miners. That's the bottom right-hand corner to your lows. Looking at uranium on a weekly chart, um, let's just uh, roll this out to five years or something. And we'll, down in the very bottom, I've got uh, a picture of Cameco, the big uranium miner. And what do you see here? This thing is just, you know, living near the 2016 lows and it just keeps dropping 11, 10, 9, 8. It's like a countdown. Um, uh, the uranium chart here, we're trying to hold some of these prior lows, but it just keeps drifting lower. So there's nothing to cheer about on these charts. Copper, 
trying to hold the bottom of this range this 254 we made it to 253 so we've made a lower low um, that's intra week and then if we look at copper on this big trend picture the problem is we keep staying below the trend line so that's an issue um, don't really have time to get into that uh, so I want to break down and, and uh, get into the gold stocks quickly one of the things here, gold continues to push higher, um, but it's the gold miners that are starting to um, slow down, and that was a pretty good place to take the clue from last time. So here's gold on a daily chart, and we're starting to get this second wave rolling over here in momentum, so it might be time to exercise a little more caution on that front. Uh, that chart looks beautiful. Um, here's GLD, and I can't get to my GDX chart. Next one, sorry. Um, so here's GDX and what we see um, this week is it got up near these prior highs um, we're, we're breaking down and this was you know pretty much a full reversal right we had a breakout above the previous three weeks and then we roll over and we close right on the lows and we're trying to hold that right now so watch it very closely if this wants to start to roll over I think um, you know it'd be great to lock in some of those profits because the move was pretty extraordinary in terms of relative strength compared to GLD, we're starting to see the same thing we saw back in this 2017 rip, and all of a sudden it rolled over hard, and that was a good place to take profits. Um, what else? Uh, looking at this uh, GDX GLD ratio, you know, it was trending up, and again, this is the trend line we're talking about breaking on relative strength compared to the S&P 500. If that starts to slow down, you probably want to exit as well. And the MACD for momentum, and you could have used PPO, doesn't matter um, in this particular case. But one of the things you see here is it's starting to make lower highs in terms of momentum. Chart. Okay, silver, again, it uh, closed up slightly higher this week, but it had a big bar with uh, higher highs and higher lows, so that's bullish. Looking at the silver iShares, the, uh, they just follow... Uh, the price of silver and you can see let's call it consolidating for the last two weeks is this a bull flag and it wants to uh, just pull back a bit and then take off to the upside maybe but it still seems to me like it needs some time to rest uh, looking at the silver miners they haven't been able to do that same sort of breakout they're trapped in kind of where they've been for five or six weeks and i want to get to lumber so one of the things, um, here's the price of lumber. We closed on the lows last week. And then this week, uh, we closed at the high of the week, but still made lower highs and lower lows. So um, not as optimistic, but if this could start to push higher again with that Jimmy Pattison pur purchase of um, Canfor Forest products, he's a pretty smart man. So it um, wouldn't surprise me that he knows when to buy it. But look at this. Um, same sort of setup in 2015 and when it started to break out of here this was a pretty meaningful place to get on board um, all that to say I don't have the answer on lumber but I just I can see from a momentum perspective it's starting to do this narrowing act where those were pretty good precedents to getting onto the uptrend um, doesn't mean this wood ETF will start to uptrend right away but I think we could draw trend lines on here and if that started to break we, we would want to be a buyer um, oh, this is the, the actual wood ETF, and you can see the trend line down here. And if this PPO starts to turn up, that would be something for me to get interested in. It hasn't done that yet, but I think it's a pretty important place on the chart. I don't have much other than I just want to say that on the Nikkei, um, you know, we're, we're down near the lows here. It made new seven-month lows this week. That kind of thing is just um, worrying me. And with this big 20-month moving average rolling over here um, at the top and becoming the ceiling, that, that really frustrates me when I look at the DAX and I see the same, uh, same picture. And I think that's up slightly. Uh, that, that those are the types of situations that just say caution. And now this is moving down and we made new six-month lows on the DAX. So with all of that... Uh, be very, very careful where your money's sitting and just make sure you, uh, if the market's going to break down, you, you have a plan um, and maybe we can bounce from here. But thanks for joining me. Have a good week and good investing. Bye-bye.